for me, it's a job. I love it. I absolutely adore it. I adore it. How lucky are we? Yeah, we are. And you play this concert and get this adulation. I've always been aware that 50% of my audience, um, certainly amongst the guys, 50% of every ma- the men in that room wanted to do what we do. They wanted to be us. Stars. Cars. Guitars. Hi. I'm Jim Cregan. I'm a guitar player, musician, songwriter, producer, and an ex-member of Cockney Rebel, Steve Harley and Cockney Rebel. For five years or so, I had a most wonderful time playing in that band. We had hit records, we toured all over the place. And today, I'm so happy to be able to introduce you to my, one of my very dearest friends, Steve Harley. Have you got a cup of tea there, Steve? I, I certainly have. I drink tea all day long. I wake up. I drink vitamin C with a few pills, which is a great drink. It's the only glass of water I'll have all day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. And then it's tea, caffeine, strong tea until about six, and then what? Guess what? Would we say, uh, as one of my friends said the other day, some uh, wine with a bottle around it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping that uh, now we're, it's probably... 40 years on you've forgiven me for for leaving the band and joining our other mutual friend Rod Stewart um, and I remember at the time of being uh, terribly upset to to break the news to you because um, because we had such a great relationship and we had so much fun in Cockney Rebel and it wasn't really anything to do with the fact that I wasn't loving it um, it was it was the fact that uh, that Rod Stewart uh, needed uh, a co-writer, and at the time uh, you didn't. You were you were self-sufficient as a songwriter, and you wrote all the music. And me being a writer, uh, uh, I I needed uh, an outlet for it. So that that was the, the main reason that I went to work with Rod. But I do you remember I picked you up I think, and we took a a, a ride to was it Kenwood House. Do you remember that? Yeah, Kenwood. <laughs> yeah, and we walked on, and it was a lovely summer's day, and we walked along the lawns there, and I told you that I was uh, that I was going to take the job. I was I was up, I was upset to to break that news to you, and I and I th- you took it very well. How do you feel about that anyway? Do you did, did what was it like for you? I I was upset myself. I the element of surprise is all I remember. Um, but you were very gentle about it, and I, I think I understood you. Right? It, I mean, everyone has a right to go forwards. It was a, it was a, it was a promotion for you. I, I, I have to say also, I, I mean, no one, as you know, I'm, no one is indispensable. The graveyard's full of indispensable people. It's, you know, so with respect, with respect, you know, I say it as I, I'm pragmatic. I'm a band leader, and I was always on the road. I had to find someone else. That sure. Was all, that was the big, yeah. Once we got over it, and still we knew we were going to remain friends. Yeah. I'm not fickle, nor are you. No, that was the important thing that we yeah, remained friends. Important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you were so, you were so um, uh, generous with the, with the uh, your attitude about it, or where you the way you approached me about it. It was so sweet, but. You know, I get over things quite quickly, to be honest. You know, I went, you know, I was, uh, I spent three months as Phantom of the Opera, working with Hal Prince uh, and Cameron and Andrew Lloyd Webber. And uh, then they ousted me for no other reason. Michael Crawford called them and he'd given up Barnum after three years. And he's a workaholic, so he didn't want to lie on a beach in Bermuda. He called them and said, have you got your Phantom yet? Uh, and then they ousted me and I was taken to the Groucho by my dear friend now Leslie Ann Jones, Fleet Street journalist and music writer. Oh yeah, I know her very well She's a really old friend of mine and she, she said uh, let's have lunch and talk about it I said, yeah, I could pay, I'll have a page in the Daily Mail about being sacked you know and she, she was trying to get out of me out through the lunch um, something bitter about it. She wanted me to be bitter and make nasty comments and slag people off. It's just not my style. Uh, so she said, well, come on then. How long did it take you to get over it? I said, five minutes. It sounded glib, but it's the truth. It's about five minutes. As long as it took me to find a good contract. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so very pragmatic. They were in breach. We had an agreement that I was going to do it for nine months. I'd cancelled I'd cancelled all my rock music life, put it all on hold. Suddenly, you know, you, so yeah, I mean, I, I really meant it. It was like, hang on, now, now, that door is closed. Now I mm. need to open another door. So once you left, I mean, Joe Partridge got the job and he knew, he'd work with us anyway. Yeah, he was he was in the band with us at the time, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah, and Snowy White. That, uh, one Snowy, other... yeah, there you go. Yeah, we've had yeah. some good players through the band. You have indeed. All the all the guys in the Cockney Rebel, the one that I was in with you, they all went to very good homes. Uh, George Ford went to the Shadows. Uh, Duncan Mackay went to Ten CC. Um, Stuart Elliott uh, went to um, Kate Bush and Eric Clapton and other people. And, and you became a, you were off to do the Phantom, and then of course everything stopped and turned round and all the rest of it. But um, I remember very clearly when you came to Los Angeles, and uh, you first uh, were, were meeting Rod. We we met in a pub, of course, uh, the Cock and Bull on Sunset, which is now a Jaguar dealership. What a waste! Um, and. I think you and I were in the bar, and Rod came through the front door. If, it, if I get, was it round that way, or you? Did you come in? I, he came in, didn't he? And he took one look at you, and he opened his arms and smiled and said, "Steve, how great to see you!" And just put his arms around you and gave you a big hug, and you'd never met before. <laughs> it was a wonderful gesture of of friendship and uh, and openness. And I remember thinking. Well, this is rather nice. It's two of my best mates are, are, are suddenly meeting and getting on. Like, already looks like it's going to be a, a long-term relationship. And I was really happy about that. Yeah, I, I, I do count him as a pal. Um, you, yeah, he's, he, he, he poached you after seeing us play those two nights of the whiskey. Yeah, the Roxy. The Ro didn't play the Roxy. We played the whiskey. Whiskey a go-go. No, no, no. Bad memory. Oh, oh, the Roxy? Oh, OK. Yeah. Well, yeah, a little theatre. And uh, he came, he was in the audience, wasn't he? Keith yeah, Park. he came in with, uh, with Brett Eklund, because I remember seeing her from the stage. I didn't really notice him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we must have been good that night. You were always good. You are a hot player. I mean, he, he, <laughs> he was dead right, wasn't he? You were great for his band. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, we've, yeah. We've, we've, we're still doing stuff together. I mean, he's, I, I think he's going to do a, a new song that I wrote uh, recently. So um, so I'm very happy about that. And I got a call yes, yes, day before yesterday from uh, Roger Taylor, who wants me to uh, play a session for him. And I haven't played a session for him for, I don't know, 20 years. And, uh, and last year I got a call from Cat Stevens to make an album with him, and I hadn't played with him for 30 years. So. So there's something weird going on about old people and old friends and associates ringing me up and and maybe they think they want to get a note out of me before I keel over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, you were telling me the other day that that you actually uh, started to uh, communicate in a kind of different way with uh, some of your your fans and the and the people that, uh, that love you and care about you uh, by kind of by uh, allowing them to ask you pretty well any kind of question they wanted. And you found it kind of uh, refreshing to to be more um, less reclusive. I think because you've you've got a reputation of being re reclusive with uh, people that don't know you as anything like as well as I do, of course. Yeah, that will change in essence. But you're you're right. I did tell you that, and um, yeah, I have. Uh, um, we did a Zoom, a professional, a fan who does it for a living organized it for us and uh, we did a zoom with 300 he could, he could accommodate 300 in one here 300 fans so all around the world australia new zealand argentina america and, uh, and they had questions that were pre-set you know they wrote in questions and then they were brought up on the screen when their question came up and it was quite therapeutic yeah and uh, just generally speaking i i have I've learned mostly in this whole 10 months, and it's horrible. I, it's just to go off at a tangent for a second. I, I had a long chat today, bored me to tears, bored me to tears. I, I don't do finance. And I had a long chat with a financial god. Oh, my God. 
are just so boring. And I try to even say, what's, what's life been like? And I, I really didn't get it across to him. If, if you're not one of us, you, you can't really be, understand it, can you? I just said to him, look, in essence, all I can tell you is that I've been traveling for 47 years and now I'm not. And that's tough. It's very, very weird not to have that trolley bag packed and uh, the tour manager writing to you every five minutes, isn't it? It's... Are you still using a shopping bag instead of a suitcase? <laughs> <laughs> Travel light, yeah. I know, I, know, I know things have been a bit slow lately, but, I mean, you could. You know, they're only about 30 quid. We actually, we actually played three shows in September. We played Did you? Three, Cheeky yeah, three, bugger. Three outdoor shows, uh, socially distanced. One was in Cars, which his name's Tom Kerridge, the chef, um, and two with my acoustic band, outdoors, uh, just splendid. It was just great to get in front of uh, but I was, uh, The first one was after six months, and I, you just went through the first song and thought, right, I have a voice, you know, I do still, I can still sing. It's weird. For me, it's a job. I love it, I absolutely adore it. I adore, well, how lucky are we? Yeah, you see we are. the world, you see the world, you see these cities and parks and rivers and galleries. I go everywhere. I'm a real tourist. Mm. And then you and you play this concert and get this adulation. How good. And, I, and I've always been aware that 50% of my audience, um, certainly amongst the guys, 50% of every man, the men in that room wanted to do what we do. They wanted to be us. Air guitar, you know, they, they wanted to be professionals like that. It, I don't know. You, I don't know who I am without that bag, without my carrier bag, <laughs> without, my, without my, my suitcase on wheels packed. I barely know who I am. If on any occasion you don't remember who you are, just keep my phone number with you. Give me a ring, and I'll let you know. Because I know it can be a bit, you know, conf, it can be confusing for you at your age, not knowing who you are. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you a little bit about. Uh, that you would, because this is Stars, Cars and Guitars, so we ought to talk about cars just for a brief second, because I believe you bought a, you bought an, an Austin Michael, didn't you? Is it, have I got the name right? The Austin Michael? <laughs> it's very weird. I'm not a petrol head at all, not a bit. But I own five cars and a, and a splitter bus. What can I tell you? I just... Do you need the splitter bus to tow the... We own, a, we own a split bus. I spent so much money renting one. I bought one. Um, yeah, no, no I, I've got cars. It's weird, isn't it? I, 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 I'm not into that sort of thing. And yet I've got an Aston Martin, I think. A, 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 a oh, to. that was it. Not an Austin DB, Michael. A DB9. It's not a great drive, you know, but you walk past it in the driveway, look at it and think, this is such a thing of beauty. This is, this, the yeah, DB9. They are. It's, whoa, dear, it's beautiful. It's pretty good. I don't drive. I do about 200 miles a year <laughs> since I've opened it. I'll take it off your hands. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just to give it, a, you know, take it down to the south of France, give it a proper clear out, you know, because I bought a little convertible Mercedes um, in the summer and uh, and I, I want to take it down or take my daughter with me and drive down to the south of France and muck about down there for a, for a couple of weeks. So get the Aston Martin out. Put, put, you know, get Dorothy to get your coupons and whatever else you might need and uh, come on down. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah, it deserves a drive. It, I mean, it is a GT, but it's a grand tour, really. They're not yeah, we need there. somewhere to keep our luggage because our car's a bit small. So if you come, we can put all our stuff in your boot. The Aston takes one acoustic guitar in a soft case. In the yeah, boot. same as mine. Yeah, yeah, it's useless, isn't it? Yeah, well, yeah. Have you still got that uh, BMW? Yeah, I can't. It's just the greatest car in the world ever. It's just, it's a, a, a magnificent beast. It's the V12, it's the V12 six litre long wheelbase. It's really nice. Good. Yeah, yeah, it's proper. With a driver on, on the road around Britain and Europe, even a lot of the time with a driver, it's just to come off stage and go straight in the back of that. It's, a, it's like a bed and it's, it's, it's a one, it's the V12. It's, a, it's faster than the Aston Martin. Nice. Does it have reclining seats in the back? Just a bit, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I like yeah, it. Yeah, you come off stage and jump straight in the back, go off to some an hour's drive to another hotel. It's, it's nice to I remember when we, used to, uh, when we used to stay in country hotels when I was in Cockney Rebel with you. And uh, we used to, in the, 
think we'd get these wonderful, beautiful old English country house hotels, could rather than stay in the city at a like uh, yeah, yeah, we like we found that far more entertaining. And one night when they'd left the bar open a bit too long, we decided to play some sort of game in the gar- hide and seek in the garden. In the woods. Do you remember that? Yeah, that's the woods. Yeah, yeah. So you... It was a most strange, bizarre game that we played, and and there was a lot of chasing around in the dark, falling over things, and shouting and screaming. Yeah, it's, uh, it it's was still... a, one. Of, it was a very odd game. I don't, I don't know what it was. We were ch- it was find the bottle. Was it? Or... It was instigated by uh, Joe Partridge. Joe Partridge, God bless him. Yeah, yeah. The hotel is still there. Uh, I forgot its name for a minute, but it's in the middle of. Um... Newcastle Racecourse. No, but that's what we were looking for. Horses then. Yeah, big old country. I like all that. I still still stay in them a lot. Let's cast our minds back to um, uh, playing with uh, at the Kenny Jones um, cancer charity that we that you did uh, when I was the uh, the co musical director with Josh Phillips of the house band, and you very kindly agreed to come on stage and sing uh, Make Me Smile and, uh, uh, and, a, and a couple of other tunes, one of them which we wrote, um, Friend for Life. And at the end of your, your set with us, which was glorious, uh, it was a really, really lovely, lovely afternoon, um, you auctioned off your guitar. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't <laughs> think I've ever seen anybody do that. I've heard about it. I've never been in the room or on the stage when somebody actually agrees they're going to part with the guitar. They're actually playing in the show. So it's a, it was a, I think it was a Takamini and a very good guitar and you auctioned it off. I, tell, me, tell me a bit more about how that works for you and, and how many times you've done it or, or <laughs> when, it, when you first thought that would be a good idea. Of course, it's always best to auction it after the show rather than before. I actually, I auction them during the performance not after or before it's all during that that's the that's the point isn't it that's where the del boy element comes into it oh. it's, great, it's great fun i've done it five six times what i did that day i think that was a tailor that was better than any attack oh wow okay it's a tailor i've given three tailors away and four three or four tech meetings yeah what you do it's always for charity you understand that i don't need the money it's like i'm giving it to the cause that i'm playing for on that stage and uh if somebody's like a minimum of five, I think that day we got seven and a half thousand. And what I do is I hold it up and say, you know, this is yours. You can have this, but it'll cost you. Um, I made a grab for it, but uh, but you, you you were too quick. Well, yeah, and I, I I say, look, um, I'll sign it. You can have the guitar. I'll sign it if you want it signed. And uh, then 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 after the next song, I'll say. Tell you what, uh, I'll throw this in. Uh, A a pair of guest tickets for any concert of mine that you can get to, not not, not festivals, but any of my concerts you want. One concert, a pair of of free tickets, guest tickets. And uh, then I might look away a bit and say, and you can come to the sound check. That's a a real, that's Mm. a book. And then, you know, a roadie runs on and goes, it's up to three grand. I'll say three thousand guys. It's not enough. It's not enough. And eventually, I get around as I did that day and say, "Tell you what, if you give the right amount of money, if I reach the right sum with this, this is four songs on." And I point usually point to Barry Wickens, who plays guitar and violin for me. I'll point to Barry and say, "He and I will come around your place and do half an hour for you and your neighbours, family." You know, they can't believe you're going to do that. You don't, oh, that's, nice. that's, 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 that's giving something away. Right? And I've done that four times. And three of us, with my Modi and Barry, we had to take a Eurostar and a TFG. We went to Cologne for one. <laughs> oh, what? Yeah. And, uh, I had to go to Glasgow on tour. We had to go an hour's drive from, the, from Glasgow. We were playing uh, in Glasgow last summer, and I had to go an hour's drive in the afternoon. To this guy's house, play to twenty people. I mean, it's yeah. incredible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that, so that's uh, loosened me up a bit. Going into someone's house, a fan, you know. But they always pay five, six, seven, two, twice. I've got ten grand. But to add that to whatever you're trying to raise funds for, you know, I, 
I, I, I, I, I started the Mick Monson Music Foundation in Hull, where Mick is from. He was my good friend. And uh, I played for free up there at Hull City Hall, like 1,200 seats. And uh, we started the Mick Monson Music Foundation, and we give five bursaries each year to music students in the, uh, uh, amongst the three college, music colleges in the Hull district. And, uh, you know, that night we did it there, raised seven and a half grand, went straight into the, the foundation pot. Yeah, that's It's lovely. easy. I've got about 20 guitars. What do you do with them? It's like, I buy them and don't sell them. <laughs> They're working yeah. instruments, working tools. You know, well, they are beautiful, especially the tailors. They're very, they're very good guitars, which is the guitar that you would never give away. Oh, well, my custom hand built for me Zomatis from 1976. I, I, I bought it. I went straight to Zomatis, Tony down in Kent. Mm. When, when, after Make Me Smile went to number one, I said I'm going to treat myself to a Zomatis hand. It was about 10 months. I picked it up way into the next year. But, right. Yeah, that's, 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 that's incredibly rare and worth an awful lot of money. Yeah, yeah, we should. Yeah, it's got your your, your name engraved on the headstock, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah I played it a few times. It's a lovely guitar. Oh, it's special. It's really special. But I've got three, three uh, Martins, which are amazing. Every everyone should have a Martin. You know that. Everyone who plays acoustic guitar should have a Martin. Yeah, I did say that to you for a long time. It took you ages and ages and ages to get one, didn't it? Get, I, I mean, that, that that Martin that I played on, come up and see me make me smile. Um, and and I, you, I can't remember what guitars you were playing. You had the Zomatis, which was already beautiful, but I think you were playing other things. I can't remember what. And I kept saying, to you, you should get one of these. And you were going, no, no, no. no well, no. yeah, it's a, just a different quality of any Martin. I've got four now. I've got a beautiful Triple O 28, D35, 12 string. Mm. But, uh, uh, a lot of Takaminis. The Takamini is, the, is really the one for the... The touring, I think. You know. Yeah, the workhorse ones, yeah. The workhorse, yeah. beautiful sound through them. When you look at uh, uh, John Bon Jovi or Bruce Springsteen, they're always playing that. I've got two of that black one. Yeah. The black, the black ES, ES. I think Springsteen probably could afford a Martin if he, you know, maybe, I don't know. He could afford to buy the Takamini company, but he plays their <laughs> guitars, you know he does. He, that, that black <laughs> ES... It's a fantastic. Once it's in your ears and you're in your monitors and in a PA, it's unbeatable. They've really, really got it perfect, that, that model. Yeah, well, the next time you're giving them away, you give one of those to me, I'll give it a try out. <laughs> I, I, I did have some Takaminis, but um, I gave them away, I think. Um, I can't remember. <laughs> For charity? No, no, I didn't. I would just give them to mates. Um, I've done that a lot, just give guitars away to people. Yeah, that's right. I was on tour and they gave us a lot of Takaminis, uh, the, the Rod Stewart Unplugged tour. They gave us Takaminis and I, di I didn't get on with them that well. So I got um, I got the the, uh, the tour manager, to whoever it was, to get me some uh, Martins. And so I had a bunch of Martins to use on tour because my favorite martin i don't take out on the road hardly at all it's too it's it doesn't have a truss rod it's old and it's it's kind of fragile and it's and it's so precious to me it means so much to me emotionally that uh, taking it on the road i would if anything happened to it i'd be a great loss it'd be losing an old friend so uh, so martin lent me well they, they said they were lending them to me but then they forgot to ask them back which i thought was very thoughtful of them I, I'm not even sponsored for plectrums, never mind guitars. N not a yeah. single thing. Not a thing. I don't, I don't care. I don't need it. But everywhere, I employ all these people, these musicians come and go in, in and out of my band. And they've all got sponsorship for the str strings are free. And uh, Yeah. I've got, I've never approached anyone. No one has on my behalf. Just... <laughs> don't need it. Don't do it. You know. I find it. Uh, it's kind of useful. I mean, I've got a bunch of uh, uh, guitars from uh, Vintage. Vintage uh, this, is this company that make these guitars that are um, sort of replicas of other guitars, but they sound better than the guitars they're replicating. I've got a, a Les Paul look-alike um, guitar which cost. I, th well, I got it for nothing, but it, it cost about five hundred quid. And it sounds better than the 200,000 quid Les Paul Black Beauty that I used to own. 
I mean, it just sounds better than it. I mean, it's that's kind of daft, isn't it? It's a bit like the Takamini sounding so good and being a, a relatively inexpensive guitar. It really is about the sound, and if it sounds right, it is right. That's it's that's pretty straightforward. But let, let's 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 move on to how you're coping with um, with the, the COVID uh, business. How you how, how you getting on yourself at home? And you know, is your wife still talking to you? Have you have you moved into the garage? You know, have you what's how's everything? Well, luckily, Dorothy and I are good friends. Yeah, um, sure. I love her. She's great. And at any minute now, we'd have been married 40 years. Wow. Well, congratulations, mate. Yeah, uh, thank uh, you. She is a wonderful girl. Yeah. She's a wonderful girl. Well, you see, that, you know, everywhere around me, you know, on the road, everyone, He's on their second or third marriage, except me. Yeah. And it's because it's because, well, it's because you, you marry young and then you find you can't give up this career and it means, it means being away a lot and she can't take it and they end up splitting up, getting divorced. It's everywhere. But um, my wife can manage the property. I mean, when you're on the road, you're in Australia or Germany or even Newcastle. You don't want a phone call. Guys were getting phone calls at two and three in the morning from a distraught woman saying, you know, the, 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 bath, the bathroom's taps dri dripping. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what you're yeah. doing, you're wrecking this guy's head, you know, just about to walk on stage. What you doing? It happened, that sort of thing, that makes an example. Whereas my wife would call the plumber and then tell me about it when it's fixed, you, you know, I just got lucky in that she's self-sufficient and so I can go away and we're happy apart. You're perfectly happy apart and happy together. It's very lucky. Yeah, that's a, that's a, it's, that is a good thing. It's, you do certainly need somebody who can cope with uh, you being away. I always found that difficult when you'd, you get into a relationship and you'd be, uh, you know, madly in love. Uh, and she would know that you were a, a musician and needed to travel and for your work. And then you'd say, well, I'm going to go away for three months on tour. And then she'd get really upset and throw a fit. And you'd say, well, it's kind of, this is, it's a bit, imagine I have a merchant, imagine I'm in the, in the Marines, the Royal Marines, and I've got to, I've got to go to Afghanistan. At least I'm not going to get shot at. I'm just going to go out and play some music, but this is what I do for a career. It's involves traveling. Um, and I would find it um, saddening that uh, that the that the understanding that that was what you had to do uh, didn't translate into the relationship. And and then then the other thing would happen is you'd come home. She got so used to you not being around that she'd be kind of who are you and what do you want? <laughs> so you know, I seem to remember I live here. Well, oh yeah, okay, all right. Well, come in then, um, and not necessarily be as joyous about having you home as she's kind of got used to you being away. Yeah, that's never uh, been an issue for us. That's that, that. Uh, I had that as a child though. It's interesting what you just said. I had that, well, I spent four years in hospital, uh, two sojourns of a year and various three months and six months. But between the age of three and 16, it totaled about nearly four years. And uh, I'd go away for six months, and I'm the second eldest of five. And I'd go away at the age of nine or ten to the children's hospital for six months, seven months. And when I got back to my mum and dad's flat, quite a big apartment in the New Cross in South London, and the, and the others were there, my older sister and three younger brothers. And I, I, at that age, I was walking into the living room, I'm, I'm practically asking... Is it all right for me to sit here? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't have many childhood memories, but I have that. It's never left me that one. No, I don't. I don't have a childhood memory. I don't remember anything before the age of six. Oh. Nothing. Complete blank. Well, were you, were you in hospital? For that, 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 when, when was it you caught polio? What age were you? Three and a half, 1954, August 54. I was three okay. Four. Right, so yeah, so up to three and a half, you wouldn't have had much in the way of memories, anyway, and uh, and and then so your so your memories start sort of in a hospital. Then I guess that's pretty strange. 
Well, that explains a lot, Steve, quite honestly. <laughs> it doesn't matter, but it, 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 it is a fact. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. And there was a time when you wouldn't speak about it. I remember you had such a funny line that when people would see that you would have a bit of difficulty walking, and uh, they'd say, so, uh, oh, right. well, Steve said, what happened to your leg? And you say, uh, you, you'd smile and say, oh, cut myself shaving. <laughs> I, thought, I thought it was a lovely, it was a lovely get out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, well, I hope, <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> well, hopefully we, you and I will get a chance to play together or or play a festival or a guest with you or your guest with me. I mean, I, I look back very fondly at that little two-hander we we did yeah. at the, uh, the Pizza Express Jazz Club kind of event, whatever that's called, and uh, and how much fun it was just the two of us sitting playing guitar and, and talking to the crowd. It's, it, it, was, it was quite different for me because whenever I've played with you before, um, it's been it's been a pretty well a full band and i leave all the talking to you but under these uh, circumstances it was quite nice for us to be able to talk backwards and forwards to each other on the stage and and take the mick a little bit not that i'm good at that at all uh and i think the the public saw a side of us that they'd never seen when they'd seen us on stage loads of times but they'd never seen us in in that kind of setting i thought was really endearing i thoroughly enjoyed it i love that little theatre for the acoustic yeah. shows, I love it. Yeah. 100, 120 seats, right? So there's no guest list. It's like no, no, no. We sell every single one, every single right. one. Thank you very much. No yeah. guests, and uh, I'll play it nine nine shows in a row. So you play to over over a thousand people, you know, 1,200, 1,300 people. So it's respectable figures, and it's yes, a you, because it's such a small room. You can charge quite a lot. I think you would charge. You were charging seventeen and six, I think. That's quite well, a lot of yeah, it was just under a pound. I remember it was it was a lot. When? <laughs> yeah. No. Anyway, I, yeah, I, I love the place. Um, very yeah, it's cool. Very cool. Well, I think uh, I'm going to go and have some lunch, Steve, my old friend. If, uh, if that's all right with you, I missed lunch because I was uh, busy farting about doing something else. You've been lovely, Steve. It's very sweet of you. Thanks, mate. It's okay. Very nice too. Bless you, James. Look after yourself, matey. Stars, Cars, Guitars was produced by Tom Stroud.